Welcome back to It's a Woman's World, an inclusive space for women and young girls to connect and lift each other up as we hear from inspiring women leaders from all over the world. Joining us today is Vanessa Santos, partner and co-CEO of We All Grow Latina, a digital and real life community of impactful Latina creators, makers, and entrepreneurs who support and uplift each other. To start us off, I just want to say thank you so much for being here, taking the time to share your story, experiences, and what makes you, you. And, um, you know, just reading about your company and the work you've done to uplift Latinas uh, is just incredibly inspiring to me. And I can't wait to hear more. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for reaching out. I love what you're doing and especially the fact that you're wanting to create more places of inclusivity where women of color can feel safe and uplifted. I find that to be so beautiful. So congratulations as well. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. We'll get right into the first question. So tell me a little bit about your background. What was your journey leading up to becoming partner and co-CEO of We All Grow Latina? Oh, my journey was far from linear. So I'm a first generation daughter of immigrants, my father from the Dominican Republic and my mother from Ecuador. But very young, they instilled the habit of working really, really hard as all immigrants and children of immigrants do. And I found myself in a lot of spaces where I was always the only Latina, the only woman of color. And more than anything, the only person that came from where I came from. So we grew up really modest. Uh, I would say incredibly humble and I'm not ashamed of it at all. We grew up with section eight. We used all of the support systems that the government had in New York city because growing up in New York city is incredibly expensive, but it reminded me of the power of resiliency, especially in the Latina and Latino community, especially with just children of immigrants. And because we carry so much of our family and ancestors hopes and dreams on our shoulders, and so my journey leading into becoming partner and co-CEO We All Grow started with constantly looking for places where I felt like I belonged because I was always made to feel like I didn't. And that led me down many beautiful paths, which were all lessons, even the times where I fell flat on my face and I would consider them a failure. But in fact, those delivered the biggest lessons. So I started my career in fashion and retail because I was studying at the same time. And I always had a lot of side hustles as well. I am side hustle queen and I'm also a pivot queen. I'm a big fan of the moment something doesn't feel good in your soul, you need to stop doing it and you must not care who and what um, people have to say about that. So I started in fashion, although I studied journalism in college, I really wanted to be in some form of investigative role in front of the camera, mainly because I'm inherently nosy and I love to be able to find the scoop. But more than anything is I really wanted to be a connector and a bridge for folks and always wanting to bring in people together. And again, that's something that I learned and seeing growing up. My family was incredibly tight knit. It was just a beautiful place to be. And I also realized that the absence of money never changed that piece of happiness for me. But I also really had this feeling of wanting to get us out of the hood, of wanting to get my family out of um, low income status. And so I worked really, really hard throughout my 20s to get myself into a lot of beautiful organizations. I've worked at startups, in publishing, in media at fashion tech startups, and then ultimately at FinTech, which was one of my big girl roles that taught me a lot of the incredible lessons on how to be a leader, on how to pivot, but more than anything on how we as women often box ourselves into certain stereotypical roles. And then we have a lot of resentment towards that. And instead of doing something about it, sometimes we beat ourselves up about it. And so I found myself at a point in my career where I had a lot of great income, a lot of great uh, colleagues and all the beautiful titles. My LinkedIn looked great, but I wasn't fulfilled inside. And so I realized then that working so hard so that my LinkedIn can look good, that's just not the way that the world should work. I don't believe we need to work to live. I believe that our experiences come from living a life full of joy and just showing up as your authentic self. And so I decided to take a mental health leave 
in support of my, with my therapist, because I was just incredibly burnt out, incredibly exhausted. And during that time, I leaned into the We All Grow community, into the Omega Hood, because it was truly an environment where I felt like I belonged, like I was being supported. And my title didn't matter. My pedigree didn't matter. My whereabouts didn't matter. What really mattered is how I was showing up authentically for myself and the community. And through a lot of support and showing up for the community, uh, my, par my now partner, who's the founder of We All Grow, Ana Flores and I connected and she just made the most beautiful offer of wanting to have me join her on this magical journey of helping to continue to grow and build socioeconomic power for Latinas and two years ago it's going to be almost my two-year anniversary is when I started as co-CEO and partner and every single day I get to wake up and do what I love the most which is helping to uplift and create powerful ripple effects for the Latina community. Wow that that's an, um, that's one heck of a story. It was um, a little windy road to get there, but that's <laughs> life allowed yeah. like, just be comfortable with the windy road. No. Yeah. And I think that really kind of that I really connect to that part of just like letting yourself lead the way instead of letting maybe a resume or LinkedIn or whatever society tells you to do what to do. Um, I, I can definitely, I definitely really re resonate or relate to that LinkedIn part, especially because yeah. Being in college, like that's all everyone talks about. You have to build your connections and you have to join certain organizations or get a certain title when really a college is all about honestly discovering yourself and that journey never really ends. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is like very easy to kind of just go into like a certain box or a certain path that people expect you to follow. But, you know, just like yourself, you went from journalism, fashion to all these other different industries. And I think it goes to show that women and anyone in general are just so capable of being multifaceted and having more, um, just having different kinds of roles um, and being successful at that too. Oh, absolutely. And you touched on something so beautiful as well um, in wanting to truly connect with what makes you unique and special. And on paper, things may look a certain way, but that certainly won't reflect how we feel inside. And the beautiful thing about college is that that is the, the period of, of, of discovery and experimentation. For my 20s, I wanted to chase my curiosity. I chased my passion points. Had I not, I felt like I would have fallen in a more traditional corporate environment, but I realized that that was just not the place for me, especially being somebody who has multiple passions and also gets bored easily. Um, and so it's really important that you identify the things that make you tick and the things that make you feel uncomfortable and not for the sake of fear, but for the sake of this is not a place where you wanna show up or are allowed to show up authentically to let that guide you into your career choices. Yeah, I think like being in college, I've I've learned that like the most important thing like to be successful or to be happy is really listening to that voice that even if it's like really deep down inside of you when everything is around you is going really crazy or there are so many distractions, if you listen to that inner voice, um, I think that will be your ultimately your guiding light, maybe yeah. like, yeah, like I was uh, like I came in as a humanities major and like I realized through a lot of like testing and trial and error and also like just blocking out the outside noise that that kind of path wasn't meant for me. And um, I, I have all of that to owe to like the inner voice and really just kind of trusting myself to go into that unknown. Um, and kind of venture into this unknown path, um, which, yeah. <laughs> I love that for you. Congratulations. I changed my major three times. <laughs> it didn't take away from where I am. In fact, I am where I am because of all the pivots and all the times that I chose myself and, ch and changed my mind when it no longer felt like it was something I wanted to do. Yeah. And like in college, like there's such a big pressure to like choose one path or you have to be like, you, you, you can't, you have to be pre-med or you have to do pre-law and that's your only path for the future. But like the fact that we're already changing our majors and like we just finished our first year, like it goes to show that like we're constantly evolving. We have um, like the next day we might wake up and decide to be something else. And I think that's completely okay. And I wish that was more normalized in today's world, but seeing women like you. No, yeah. well, I wish so as when I, and I think I want to encourage folks that are in college that the reason why it isn't normalized is because it benefits the institutions. Yeah. It benefits the institutions to have y'all in a path 
um, to have you on a specific way of being because the ones that are really disrupting and changing the status quo are the ones that are choosing to go left when everyone else is going right. And so I mentor a lot of college students and every single time they ask me about this point in the road where they want to change their major, but what will their parents think? I always have to remind this, remind them of this. And I mean this with a lot of love. If you are living and building a life for your parents, the moment that they are no longer on this physical earth, you're going to feel incredibly lost because you designed and curated a life just to please somebody else, but you're completely missing the point of the human experience, which is to please yourself, which is yeah. to find joy, which is to really show up as your, as your most authentic self. What is your purpose in this lifetime? And I know that question of what's my passion, what's my purpose can get, can give people a lot of anxiety, but I don't think it needs to be one thing. I think it just needs to be a value. It needs to be a mission versus a singular, um, actionable, tangible descriptor that looks good on, on LinkedIn. It needs to be something that gets you up at, at you know, in the mornings that makes you want to get up with joy that makes you be comfortable with the pivots that makes you be happy with the hard times, because as we continue to grow and evolve in all careers, even if it's the one that you love the most, you're still going to find moments of hardship. But the important thing is if you know that you're doing it for a reason, because it, it's what you were called to do, those hard times are going to be blessings because those blessings will lead into the lessons that are going to help you be exactly who you're meant to be. So I, I, I can feel that the pressure from folks, the parents wanting their kids to do a certain thing or, or for students to follow what their siblings. And I really always encourage folks to sit with themselves and understand their inner workings, to understand what is that inside voice telling them they're meant to do, whether it's being an artist, whether it's being a creative, whether it's being a writer, whether it's being wanting to create cookies and just sell them I think we need to I be comfortable with what's our own idea of success because that's what's going to help guide us because again if we're continuing to live our life for everybody we'll become something to everyone else but then become no one to ourselves and more than anything we need to be so comfortable with the thoughts in our head but if we're trying to please everybody else that's just not going to happen yeah that that's some beautiful insight and when you mentioned like some people feel this kind of pressure to please their parents. I think that's really relevant and like a common uh, topic for children of immigrants. And being one myself, I did kind of struggle with, you know, maybe I should go with a career path or a kind of future that would provide my parents some kind of security and sense a peace of mind that they don't have to worry about me in the future. And I think that's some, something a lot of my friends and just college students in general relate to because you know, our parents, they come to America, they build a life for us here. And at the end of the day, we just want to make them proud. And we want to show them that they didn't come here for no reason. And um, sure. I think it's important to like, definitely keep that in your mind. But also, um, they came here for a reason so that you can do whatever you want and pursue what the, what the American dream looks like to you or whatever, you know, future you want to build for yourself. And so... Yeah. And the way we make them proud is to show up as our most authentic self, is to stand in our power. We might make them proud on a superficial level if we want, if we follow the career path that they had designed for us, that they had envisioned for us. But peace of mind and security are two very different things because there's no such thing as career and job security, right? This world is ever changing and there's no such thing as something that lasts forever. I think the impermanence of things is something that folks need to get comfortable with. And peace of mind comes when you know that you're doing something for your highest self, which is your personal legend is the reason why you were here. And that's how you make your family proud. And that's how you make your parents proud. For me, I'm very lucky that my parents, even though they wanted me to study certain things, because again, they, they wanted that sense of security, um, but that was incredibly safe. And I am just somebody that considers myself a bit of a wildflower. I want to try all the things, experience all the things, understand and learn. I love being a student of life. And I can never do that if I played it safe. And in showing up authentically as myself and choosing myself every single day and choosing to follow my curiosity points is what makes my, my parents proud because ultimately I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, the part about you, you know, continually choosing yourself, I think that's something that I've, you know, had like a big realization this past summer and this past year, my first year being in college that ultimately, like, I'm, it's going to be me at the end of the day, I'm going to be the one that's going to bed, and I'm going to be the one stuck with my thoughts. And so I wow. have to be okay with myself and not just okay, but also like, 
um, be able to love myself completely and be happy with myself because I think a lot of college students struggle with, you know, they come back home to their dorm at the end of the day and they can't be with themselves and be alone in their thoughts. Um, And so I think just, yeah, trying to be authentic to yourself and honestly keep trying to learn more things about you because you change every day um, is definitely like the way to go and to build a beautiful future. Yes. I love where this conversation is going. (laughs) I remember the pressure of being a college student and all the thoughts and all the feelings and the anxiety and the the stress of trying to keep up and and doing all the programs and getting all the credits and landing on all the lists and getting the right internship and getting the right job. It's really a lot for a young person when they haven't fully synthesized how this is making them feel because we're living up here. We're living in our minds, trying to please so many things and so many people and so many institutions. And what I would also offer as a piece of advice is that sometimes we're not going to have all the answers, but let's make sure that the answers um, that are coming to us are coming to us because we're choosing to be in places and not being in places because we're being told to be there. I think it's really important to understand that regardless of your age or where you are, you always have the freedom and power of choice and choosing what makes you light up and what brings you joy. And when you get back to your dorm room at night, and you're dealing with all these thoughts in your head. I discovered journaling at a very young age. I'd been writing since I was a little girl. I have a dream to write multiple books and scripts and series, again, going back to being a um, multi-passionate. And that was a really good way for me to get what was out in my head onto paper because I knew paper wasn't gonna judge me. And then eventually that became my safe space, but it allowed me to pour it out of myself so that I don't sit with it. So that it doesn't occupy space in my mind, because many of the times we must not believe what we think, right? And sometimes we're like, but I thought this thought, how could this not be true? But we have to remember that sometimes our brain um, is an incredibly smart muscle that is just there to protect us, but oftentimes it can limit us. So we just have to get back to that place of feeling and how things are making us feel. And it's going to be normal to be nervous and uncomfortable and have anxiety and, and all these things, because being in college and exploring the world and learning new material is always very confronting. But at the end of the day, if you are just knowing that you're going to evolve, that this is part of your journey, it's mm-hmm. going to make things a lot easier to, to stomach versus trying to strive for perfection. I always say strive for authenticity, not perfection, because perfection in the eyes of whom? Perfection for what? As long as you're pleased with yourself and you love yourself and that journey of loving yourself will also take time. So again, You don't need to know everything now and it's completely okay to not be okay. And it's also completely okay to be confused or not sure about something that is part of the discovery of being human. And that is what you need to learn to love so that you can get to a place where you feel like you're conducive to your future self and you're giving your future self all the flowers and the love that they deserve. Because many times we don't even give ourselves our own flowers and we all need to be better about that. But I love that how you position things and how you're creating this beautiful open conversation for folks to be to honest about how they feel and the challenges that it is with being a college student in the world today. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. No, yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, you're touching on some more like mental health themes and topics that are really prominent and sometimes ignored in college spaces and honestly in every world and every day. Um, workspaces and everything um and you know talking about journaling that's something that I have always I guess like subconsciously or unintentionally relied on when I was a little kid just you know wanting to write all these books like you have and uh, I think that kind of uh, con- transformed into intentional journaling and even just setting aside like 15 minutes a day just to write about whatever is on my mind or something that annoyed me um, I think it does help to see it on paper and to kind of realize that like it's not a part of you it's like more like just words or just fragments of like words um and then also like channeling in that into other creative spaces I found like poetry um has been like incredibly healing to me or um yeah just venting to other people that are you know the people that you've built these safe spaces with is honestly essential to not being to being happy not just outside of college but in your future and in other social social spaces with family and with work and everything yeah, I feel like any any student that enters college or any person that enters the workforce for the first time, it should come with a journal. Yeah. <laughs> Get a journal so they can start synthesizing what it is that they're feeling and not live in their heads because sometimes that can be a really dark place. 
Yeah, yeah. I think living in our heads uh, can get into, it can make us feel lost sometimes. And I guess like detaching ourselves from those thoughts and looking at it from more of a, an objective or from a further perspective definitely helps to recenter things yeah. um, and live life authentically. <laughs> there you go. I, I'm, I'm honestly impressed and like, I just love how like, this conversation. We just uh, went, like we had questions, but we're just letting, we're just letting intuition guide us. And that's what's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about your role at We All Grow Latina. What is yes. your favorite part of the job and what does a typical day in your role look like? Oh my God. So uh, I would start with the typical, what my day to day and then my favorite part. So the beautiful thing about being the co-CEO and partner of being your own boss, of owning your own business, is that you get to design what your day looks like. So there is actually no typical, which happens to be my favorite part of, of my role. Um, I get to show up and set the big vision for how we continue to cultivate our community, for how we continue to show up for our community, the kinds of in real life and virtual events that we design. And I get to do that so harmoniously with my partner, Anna. And it comes from a really deep, soulful place. So something her and I are really passionate about is soul-centered entrepreneurship because we are creating a business in a world that has 15 million how-to books on how to grow and scale a business that has all of these people that come from a really particular sense of privilege on how a business should be run and cultivated. But those things do not apply to us because we did not have those tools. And so we've had to learn how to navigate and build businesses from a very different place, but it ended up being our superpowers because now when her and I meet to ideate, and we're thinking about the next few years and we're thinking about how we could show up for the community. It comes from the, it comes from the heart. It comes from the soul. It comes from a place of, we know that this would be beneficial to us. So we also can feel that this would be beneficial to the community. And so every single day is different. And that brings me a lot of joy because I find that the reason why folks have anxiety when they wake up and go to work is because they know exactly how their day is going to go. They know exactly what they're going to do what commute they're going to take, what classes or what schedule they're going to have, the time they get come home. And that can get incredibly exhausting. And the monotony of that can make people feel stuck. And so what I love about how I've curated and designed my life and how my partner and I have designed, designed the culture for We All Grow is that every single day, you we never know what's going to happen. One day we are hosting a beautiful campaign, speaking about wealth and investing and helping to build a business. The next day we're launching grant opportunities to help entrepreneurs have access to the funds that they need to scale and grow their business. The next day we're having our Latinas de Libros, which is our book um, circle where every month we're unveiling a new beautiful book from a member of our community. We get to um, convene at Weekend Fest, which is our temple event of the year, which is like two beautiful intentionally curated days for our community to come together and support and uplift one another. We get to talk about mental wellness, um, mental health. Uh, uh, we figure out how to help each other with their careers. And it's incredibly special to be able to just show up and listen to hear from the community on what it is they need and then actually create something tangible for them so they can go ahead and implement that in their life. And so the ripple effect of what we do is what brings me pride and joy. And so my favorite part of the job is that I don't know what every day will look like. I'm open to the opportunity and possibility because that allows us to create from a real place that's limitless so that our community can actually thrive. I love that every day you kind of get to chart your own path and I guess I call it put attention or bring attention to the parts within your community that um, need working on or that needs uh, a new resource to be developed. Um, and I think it's incredibly inspiring that you guys aren't just paying attention to just one aspect of your community. You're addressing everything from mental health to entrepreneurship um, to even like having like, meetups. And uh, yeah. I guess you guys are really uh, focused on making sure that the community stays intact. Um, and I just love that there are so many opportunities for these women to embrace their culture, embrace their identity, but also figure out ways to grow in terms of uh, professional development or personal development. Um, I think it's just incredibly beautiful that you guys are just providing these re resources for these women to write their own story and to grow beautifully in their own identity and have that in such a comfortable and safe space because that's something that in today's world is really hard to find, um, especially mm -hmm. being a minority woman, um, you struggle to find these safe spaces. 
Absolutely. Especially because I feel like as, as minority women, we do grow up in environments that are incredibly competitive. They really, you know, and when I say they, I mean, patriarchy, I mean, societal, the systems, the systemic biases that exist is because they want us to compete with one another because it keeps us small. And so what I love about our Amiga hood, which is a community, is that we truly champion one another. And our motto is when one grows, we all grow. So if any single woman of color is opening a new door, is creating a new table, is showing up in a space, it allows all of us to be able to walk that path and show up as well, especially in these environments where, again, they're wanting to keep us um, contained because they understand the power that we actually yield. Something that I've been wanting to manifest for a really long time that has been taking space in my mind. And I've written this down and I've socialized it with a few really close friends and I haven't spoken about it publicly yet, but I wanna really find a way to enact is if you think about the purchasing power that women of color bring to the GDP, to the global economy. And if we decided that one day us women of color will stop spending, the economy will collapse. And we don't get nearly as enough distribution as we deserve when you consider how much we actually pour into the economy, how much we pour into our family uh, units, how much we pour into the education system, how much we pour into the workforce, how much we pour into culture. So what we receive is incredibly disproportionate to we, what we actually create and move in this country and in the world in general. And so for me, it's really just a huge pride and joy to be able to continue to create spaces for women of color and Latinas to thrive, to be wealthy, to be successful, knowing that they have an amiga hood behind them, helping them win, because there's plenty of space, more than enough space for every single one of us to have a crown. Yeah, yeah exactly. That really puts that name, we all grow into a completely different and much more beautiful light when you um, talk about um usually there isn't enough space for women and uh, to grow and be successful and to honestly lift each other up. And <clears throat> I think that's something that I've honestly kind of fallen um, ill to, or like fallen into that trap of patriarchy and society saying that, you know, there's only, there's this uh, lucrative job opportunity or internship and only one of you guys can have it. And yeah. that in doing that, that kind of pits us against each other. And it uh, prevents um, women and young girls, especially young girls, to develop this mindset, to realize that um, I'm in it with my sister, I'm in it with my friend, I'm in it with um, who I, my coworker. And if one of us succeeds, then we also succeed as well. And I had like such a great opportunity this past year to be in Harvard Girl Up. And that's where I realized um, that we need more spaces where there it's completely like, completely full of girls and young women because we're not used to seeing that at all and especially in leadership positions like i i feel like before my first thought or my first approach was why am i not in this position and she is instead and mm -hmm. i didn't realize that that's coming from a place of ingrained patriarch patriarchy yeah. and sexism honestly and wow. I think being aware of that and retraining my brain to say no it's actually amazing that she's in that position because it's uplifting voices like me and it's uplifting people that look up to her as well. And um, I think once I adopted that mindset, I just realized how natural it felt to want to root for a fellow girl or like a fellow woman, because it's wow. it's advancing the whole you know population. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's such a beautiful mindset to, that you have, Gary, on, honestly. And I really wish it was a mindset that many more young women and girls adopted. And it's something that we have to sort of unlearn, right? We have, there's so much unlearning needs to happen across the, the sphere of what society has ingrained into us so that we can relearn the things that are actually going to be a service to us and service to our collective. When you see somebody doing something really well, or you see somebody that has something that you want, I would love to get us all to look at that gap as to why it is that we're feeling how we're feeling as opposed to needing to tear that woman down for why she has it. Instead, we need to kind of reflect and look back onto ourselves and say, what is it that she has or what is it that she's doing that I am not or that I'm doing? And so many times those feelings of, of jealousy 
aren't always a bad thing. I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, back in the day when I worked in fashion, you know, I always saw that there was a lot of girls around me that had disposable income to be able to buy all the outfit and all the couture and go to all the fashion week. I unfortunately did not because I was a breadwinner. I was also the caregiver. I was taking care of so many folks in my family, but I also understood that my journey was going to be different. So I wasn't going to me measure myself against somebody else's ruler. Even then, though, I still had those moments of jealousy, like, oh, why does she get to do that and not me? And instead of bringing her down, I decided, well, let me find a way to be in those circles and let me find a way to understand and let me find a way to befriend. Let me find a way to um, be in that proximity because proximity is power so that I can also receive that kind of joy. And the moment that I decided to step out of my own comfort zone and focus on my measure of success and not compare myself to what somebody else has, that's when all the doors really started opening up for myself. So I think it's such a beautiful mindset that you have in being able to acknowledge that from early on, we're constantly being put in competition but more than anything we're always being complimented on the exterior right when you see a young girl in the dress you're like oh you're so pretty but when you see a boy you're so strong you're so smart so when you consider the descriptive adjectives that are being used for boys and girls as for genders growing up that clearly will start embedding into how we show up and how we look and measure other folks and so I think it's a beautiful I wouldn't call it a trend, but it's a beautiful journey evolution that I'm seeing with Gen Z and millennial truly wanting to create more bridges of connection so that we're helping one another and saying, how can I open up the door for you? Or what advice can I give you so that you can feel empowered enough to show up however it is that you choose to show up in which in however light, whoever you choose to love, whatever you choose to do without having to bring down your, you know, the peer next to you, because we all deserve to succeed. Yeah. And when you talk about proximity as power, I realized that once I had that mindset where we should be bringing everyone up because it's for the benefits and just to see someone grow and be successful, that's the way it should be. When I adopted that mindset, I realized that I found it much easier to talk to certain women or young women that, you know, previously I thought weren't approachable as all, or maybe I'd villainize them for some reason. Yeah. And so once I had kind of started opening that door and like making that first step and in initiative, I realized that I had been, you know, preventing myself from making such many more beautiful connections with other women and girls. Um, and I think that makes our community even stronger when we, you know, maybe make that first step or first initiative towards, you know, sparking a conversation with someone that maybe you could give advice to or you could take advice from them because ultimately we're all on our own learning journey. And so why should we limit ourselves um, to, you know, talking to someone else or looking up to someone as well? I think I think we should try to like keep our pride or set aside our pride and know that it's okay to look up to someone that might be our own age or, you know, just a few years older than us. Um, they're just, everyone's doing something amazing in their own right. Absolutely. Or even younger. There's so yeah. many incredible women that are, that are in my life that have accomplished the most amazing things that I can't wait to accomplish, right? That I can't wait to have perhaps my own brand, that I can't wait to have my own book, that I can't wait to write a script. And I look and I've seen other women that have done it. And many of them are much younger than me. And that just inspires me because it, it tells me that they had the know-how and the foresight to really believe in themselves and go after it. And I want to be able to do that as well. So I learned from them. And so that's the beautiful thing about this human experience is that you can truly learn from anyone around you. Just make sure that your circle is conducive of wanting to help you become the person that you, that you truly want to be and not the kind of circle that's going to keep you stuck because it makes them feel comfortable. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, because like a lot of people, um, or I think it's important to realize that not everyone will have the same mindset as you. And so, okay. yeah, you really need to be intentional with like the friends you make. Um, I think that's really relevant for the college experience um, because ultimately the way you want to be in the world will also impact um, others, the ones that you interact with. And so in order to be your authentic self, I think um, you also need to make sure that you're around people that also believe in yourself and are trying to be their own authentic selves. <laughs> as repetitive as that sounds. <laughs> no, it's so true. It really matters who you share your energy with, 
Energy is one of the most expensive commodities along with your time. And if your energy doesn't feel good and around certain people, that's something that we need to learn how to listen to, right? Especially in college, we learn so much that is very cerebral. We learn a lot of things that are incredibly tactile, um, that are uh, tactable. Um, and we don't spend enough time cultivating our inner knowing. We don't spend enough time cultivating how is it that our energy feels around certain people, around certain environments, and understanding that why, because that is what's going to help us into adulthood as we continue to venture into these unknown spaces, because that's what a lot of us are doing, being the first in our family, just being the first in general, in opening up doors that many of us haven't been in. And when you start to understand that inner knowing as to why you feel how you feel that'll start shifting the circles and the places and the things that you do especially for me personally when I started therapy many years ago and started to truly make peace and healing with the things that have transpired in my life when I was younger I started changing and adopting habits because again I know who it is that I want to become and continue to become and that can't happen if I'm spending my time at happy hours that can't happen if I'm constantly spending all of my earnings on things that aren't actually building wealth and so I've changed it I've changed so much of my lifestyle that the things that I used to do and the people I used to hang out with make no damn sense anymore. It just doesn't make sense. And that's okay. You don't have to constantly be with the same people either. I think it's so important and refreshing to understand that every portion of your life, whomever comes in, is just a chapter in the story of your life. And you're the director, you're the main character, you're the producer. Design it as such that you feel really good about all the roles that you've played in every stage and facet of your life. Yeah, I think the first step to feeling truly authentic and feeling like yourself every day is honestly with yourself. I feel like we usually turn to so many other resources or to other people to figure out what we want to do with our lives. But really, the first step is within ourselves and listening to that voice. And I think you bring up, uh, you know, talking about, you know, being in certain circles or, you know, trying to figure out which um, kind of people make you feel really good inside. And that's something I really had to learn in college because I've always been very aware of my social battery. And mm -hmm. just as soon as I would go out with a certain group of people or be in a certain space, I would instantly feel that like 100% go all the way down to 0%. And so once I figure out how to balance and find that sweet spot with that social battery and with certain social spaces, I found myself being even more willing to put myself out there because I think I'm more of an introvert naturally, but once I kind of found that balance of where I'm supposed to be and where I want to be, it was so much easier to step out of my comfort zone and to meet new people and to find myself in these spaces where I might not have been before. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I have done therapy and I think that is like such an amazing tool that many people often overlook. And uh, I think that's fair because, you know, society doesn't really portray it in the best light and right. we have our own like inside in our head or stigmas. And once we address that and get over that little block, you know, going into therapy was one of the best decisions that I ever made. And, um, you know, I was able to like talk to myself through some thoughts that weren't great and figure out how to get to the other side. And that is, has been such a helpful tool that now I could do it on my own and I can, you know, take a step back and, you know, kind of just go from step one, step two, in terms of how I can deal with my thoughts and, I think that, you know, it's such a great tool that I think everyone should try at least once. <laughs> Kudos to you and yay to therapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, I think everyone could use one because I mean, who doesn't want someone to vent to and, you know, have a safe space. <laughs> I love therapy. It's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but we talked a little bit about identity and her heritage and you coming from the Latina community. So I wanted to see more about how your identity and heritage has shaped your approach towards leading, founding a company and leading that community within We All Grow? It's so interesting, this question. It's a great question, by the way. So being the eldest daughter, being the firstborn in this country, I felt like made me a natural born leader. Um, I remember really early on when I entered the workforce, um, I looked over at my, many of my peers that were my age or younger, and it's like they already had all of this experience um, that was very tactical, that was about the workplace that had all these internships 
And I realized it's because, again, they had that access point that had those entry points for members in their family that already gave them sort of that leg up so they can do those internships, have those jobs, whereas I didn't have that benefit. But what I did have working for me is that if I'm able to manage my schoolwork, my 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 career early on while also managing a household, while being an older sibling, while being the eldest cousin, while helping aunts and uncles with important documents and paperwork, I'm like, wait, hold on. If I can manage all of this, I can use those skills. Those skills are transferable and they're going to help me in so many more areas of my life. And I recognize that really early on, but putting that on paper was always challenging for me because there was just no way of, of showing that as an actual um, value for an employer. And so it just made me want to show up in a very different way. And in, early on in my career, my goal was to just outwork everybody. I didn't have to be the smartest. I didn't have to come from um, a, a Ivy League. I didn't have to do all those things, but I would absolutely going to be the hardest worker. And that truly set me apart from many folks that basically had things handed down to them. So they didn't have the same appreciation, whereas I had so much gratitude and so much appreciation. But then, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> I choked on my own on my own spit. I love it when that happens. Um, but then that appreciation allowed me to also have that like knowing of, wait, this isn't the right way of managing myself and my career because it's what led me to burnout, working the hardest, getting there earliest, being the last one to leave, taking on all the extra assignments, all the extra projects, thinking that's what's going to help me get promoted. That's what's going to give me the visibility that I needed. And all it really did was burn me out. It certainly did give me a lot of amazing lessons and learnings. But now I apply that in the culture that we have cultivated and we all grow, that I've applied that in all the things that I do is that you can lead and you can thrive, but with ease. You don't have to run yourself ragged in, in order to be successful. Um, and so my approach going forward is if you find that you have something that somebody else doesn't, that's your superpower. Even the lack of is your superpower. That naivete, I always feel it's a superpower. When folks are like, I just don't know this. That is a massive superpower because it allows you to look at something from a very different lens. Whereas many folks that study that one thing and that's all they've ever known, ever studied and ever looked at, they're going to look at it from a very particular lens. And what's most beautiful are the folks that can come in and kind of see the mosaic of opportunities and use that to help build and grow something. So I always now approach things from a sense of wonder, from a sense of curiosity. And that has to do with the fact that I've had to navigate things on my own ever since growing up. I've always had to, you know, navigate uncharted waters. What is, you know, helping my family with their citizenship papers, with the social security documents, with school papers, figuring out my own FAFSA and all those things. Um, when nobody in my family spoke the English language and I had to figure it out on my own, that I was like, for me, that was the most difficult and challenging thing that everything else is honestly figure outable because there are resources, there's YouTube, there's Google, um, there's so many opportunities out there for learning that there's no excuse and no reason why we can't be successful. Um, and so I would say that my identity and heritage really did shape my, um, my grasp of looking everything as an opportunity as opposed to as a challenge and seeing things as everything can be figured out because I figured out things difficult as a child that I had no business doing, but somehow I managed that as an adult, I absolutely have enough tools in my arsenal that I can absolutely figure out whatever comes my way, especially in the entrepreneurship world, especially when you are a self-funded, 100% Latina-owned business, um, moving and navigating in a world where folks don't necessarily recognize value of self-funded business that have contributed over 15 million to the back to the community. Because again, if you don't raise capital, it's not necessarily considered something that TechCrunch will probably write about. And so again, I'm just really proud of what we've been able to accomplish us in, us beautiful dynamic Latina women in our organization coming from where we come from. And that really has to do with my heritage is growing up Latina, growing up first gen, I feel like actually gave me a leg up to show up in places and look at opportunities as opposed to looking at the challenges. And that's what truly set me apart from everyone else around me in those work environments. Wow. I think your experiences like from, you know, being a young child to being a woman now, it really goes to show that resilience and also reshaping your perspective on certain things 
are extremely pivotal to being successful in your own way. Um, and, you know, talking about whether or not you need to have like a certain degree or like a certain IQ or, you know, a certain skill. I don't think it's all it's about that at all. I think it's more about that discipline and hard work that you put in, because at the end, end of the day, you could be the smartest person in the room. But if you don't put in that work and you don't have that respect for that work, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to be stagnant for your whole career or your personal life. And I think that's something that a lot of children of immigrants or a lot of immigrants really learn from, you know, the start that um, these opportunities aren't going to be given to me or I'm going to have to figure out how to do this certain skill or task from the ground up. And even though sometimes we don't realize that those experiences subconsciously affect the way that we approach other tasks if they're in a different realm or in a different career. And um, I think that's something that we need to bring more attention to because, yeah, they aren't apl applicable to a resume or a LinkedIn, but there are so many ways you can use those built those built in superpowers that you've been training for all of these years into, you know, building a beautiful career or building a relationship or anything in general. Um, those immigrant and first gen experiences are yeah, superpower, because not everyone can, has access to those kinds yeah. of things. And it gave me the superpower of emotional awareness, emotional yeah. intelligence, which is not something that institutions, right, try to cultivate. Um, IQ is always sort of championed, but EQ is something that allows you to connect with people and understand people. And when you do, that truly is what helps you move and navigate. And so a, a benefit of being first gen was that I excelled in emotional intelligence because I was able to read people. I was able to understand family members. I was able to communicate what they were trying to communicate in a way so that those folks at those offices and government offices, when needed to understand, I could articulate that by emoting it just based on what I was picking up. And that served me so well today and just throughout my life and being able to connect with people in a different way, just because I can read energy as opposed to living up here in our mind where we realize again, it doesn't always sell, it doesn't always serve us to to live up here and so for me it's a privilege and now i look back thinking of being first gen as a blessing because it gave me the emotional awareness to be able to be in in, in places to actually be of service to people in our community yeah i i love that you bring up emotional awareness because i feel like that's something so common with uh children of immigrants or first gen um kids growing up we kind of have to learn how to navigate being in the middle of two cultures, being in America and the culture back home. And, you know, the way you interact with family members back home is completely different with the way you interact with people in America or in school. And, you know, kind of trying to find that bridge between these two completely different worlds, you know, it built my awareness and my, you know, interpretation skills, I guess, about, you know, the way, the things that my parents wanted to, I guess, express to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to understand in both, through both lenses. And um, that's something really transferable to the workspace or a real world, because you're interacting with so many diverse people with so many different backgrounds. And it also helps you to be more understanding of other people. Um, because not always, because you want to be treated the same way that you treat another person. And so you have to give them that same kind of respect and also acknowledge it, a, acknowledgement of their cultural background and maybe where they're coming from, um, because that's not always, that's not always a given, unfortunately. 100%. That was it. <laughs> that was, that's a threat. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, but, you know, we've talked more about being a minority woman and being a Latina from your perspective, but what are some specific challenges that you've had to face as a mi minority woman in the business world? I love this question because I have had many challenges that I've faced being a Latina in the business world. I've, I've spoken a lot about it on my TikTok because I've had a lot of jarring experiences that. I always felt like I was in some kind of sitcom, like there's no way that this is actually happening and this is real and the people around me are allowing this. But I also recognize that I was in those situations because I was going to be that pattern breaker. And there are quite a few that I faced um, as a Latina in the corporate world. One that stands out, there are a couple that stand out. One in particular, I was on a business, an international business trip, and I was actually leading our product team. And seeing a Latina woman um, in tech is not very familiar, especially not leading a product team and being the product owner. And so when we get to this meeting with these very prominent individuals, 
I looked across the table and I realized that I was the only woman and the only Latina. And when we start doing introductions and going across the table and it came to my turn and I was about to introduce myself, the gentleman who we were meeting with, the client of this massive conglomerate, pushed over a notepad and kind of paused me and said, no, 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 you're here to take notes, completely dismissing me and just assuming that because I am a woman and Latina, that I must only be there to take notes. And I must surely not have, you know, have the quality, the qualifications to contribute to the conversation. And at first there was like a moment of like, when your body just starts to heat up and you're just like, is this actually happening? Like, did this person just shush me in this way? And everybody just looked incredibly uncomfortable. And I just had to reserve myself because I also knew that if I reacted in a way that was um, stereotypical, it would continue to have him look at women and Latina in that box. And I knew that I needed to be and show up differently in order to, again, be that pattern breaker. And so I just politely looked at him and I said in, in Spanish, I was like, oh, I'm actually not here to take notes. I am the product lead for the team. This is, these are actually my team members. I'll be the one giving the presentation. And his face just went completely like, like he just was dry. And I said, well, thank you so much for passing me the notebook. I'm happy to take any, any notes, but should everybody else get a notebook as well in case of ideas come through? And I think the fact that I didn't call him out and the fact that I didn't have to meet his and get, you know, lower my frequency to meet him where he is, truly not only educated my team in seeing and how to respond to the situations, but helped me stand in, in my power in that I knew that I was going to consistently be in environments where people are going to assume or belittle me. And what felt really good about that was not even the fact that I felt that this was a teachable moment for him. But when we exited the meeting, the receptionist pulled me aside and said, you know, that was the first time I saw a woman in that room. That was the first time I saw a Latina, anyone in general speak back to him. And she just looked at me and said, thank you. And please keep going. And I didn't recognize the power of that until many months or years later, when I was delivering a, a keynote address for Forbes, when they had asked me, what was a pivotal moment in your life? And then when I shared that story on TikTok and people were like really relating to it, I was like, whoa, okay. I realize now that what may have seemed like just a blip in my career was very poignant in fact, because there's so many other women, there's so many other women of color that are consistently being marginalized to a specific role just because of our gender. And another one that I can think of is um, oftentimes I became the planner of meetings. So because again, I found myself in a lot of startup environments, it's one of those roll up your sleeves, everybody wears multiple hats kinds of things. But I also happen to be a natural organizer. Again, I am the eldest, I have to corral many children consistently and get them, you know, to, to behave. And sometimes my mothering tendencies tend to kick in. But it's important that you start setting the boundaries. Otherwise, you're going to be seen as the office party planner and you're no longer going to be respected for the role that you were hired to do. And that happened to me in a specific job where every single time we gathered for brainstorming ideation sessions for a new product rollout, I always initiated the, hey, what is everybody wanting for lunch? And I took all the lunch orders. I took all the coffee orders that slowly but surely my value became that and not actually what I was here to contribute. And I recognize that I pigeonholed myself into that role because I also had my own um, doubts on what I can contribute. My own doubts as to how could I be the only woman here? How could I be the only Latina here? How could I be the only first generation immigrant here? But I knew that, I had to step away from that role. Otherwise, any other woman that would come after me would be the one grabbing the lunch orders and the coffee orders. And I had to change that by just the next time the meet we had those brainstorming sessions that occurred on a monthly basis and people were kind of waiting around looking for lunch. I was just like, well, don't look at me. I'm here to contribute. And it was just a, such a direct comment that made everybody stop in their tracks, but it helped me as well know that I am more, much more than just being the one to organize the, the food for everybody. I had something to contribute and I needed to really stand and own that. Wow. Those, those two stories are just completely shocking and also incredibly yeah. inspiring at the same time. And I think they're two completely different situations, but they still have that common value of you standing firmly in your ground and in yourself. Um, because ultimately like we're going to, we can't wait for anyone else to come and save us and rescue us because, you know, 
even especially for minority women, that is not going to happen. You're going to be placed right. into a box and you're expected to stay there and be quiet. And we have to rely on ourselves to, you know, tell ourselves and be our own superwoman and stand up for ourselves. And I, I honestly just cannot fathom that that person, that client put you in that box of being like a secretary or something, which is so com- like it. I'm like, it's so stereotypical. Oh, it's it's very serious. I've, I've had folks that won't even look at me because I was the woman in the room. I've had folks that ask me to go and get lunch for people. I mean, it's been, at first it was very jarring because I'm like, wait, why do I keep getting singled out? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I realized, well, they are just used to behaving in this way. And I need to use these as teachable moments yeah. um, as opposed to just being combative or adversarial about it. And just instead push back and say, no, I'm not going to be the one to grab the lunch or, Hey, I'm actually speaking here or stop cutting me off and repeating exactly what I say, uh, allow me to speak. Cause there's a reason why I'm here. And that's not something that I feel is going to end um, anytime soon, especially when we are still in a lot of environments that are very male dominated. And especially when we live in a world where we still don't have um, ownership of our own bodies. So I think it's important that we continue to share these stories as embarrassing as they may be, as shocking as they may be, because they're still very prevalent today. And those are just two of about eight more that I can think of, but we certainly don't have enough time for that one in this episode, maybe for the next one. (laughs) No, I think like those interactions are just so normalized, like being like a woman in a classroom and then, you know, trying to contribute to a conversation, you're just naturally skipped over or, you know, whenever someone's introducing um, themselves to you and your friends, I, there's been so many times where a man has just skipped over me and introduced my, themselves to my male kind of or my or my male friend. And I would walk away from that conversation feeling as if I was a literal ghost and they didn't even mm-hmm. see me. And so like, there's just real power and take, taking that first step and saying like, hi, I'm here, like, this is my name and so-and-so, or taking that first step and, you know, honestly forcing yourself your way into certain conversations, but doing it also with grace and with respect for the entire environment, because, you know, you don't know who else is watching you. And just like that receptionist was paying attention. um, Those are also moments to not only, you know, give yourself or take back that power, but also show other women that, um, you know, you can do this as well. You can take back that power and highlight your voice for so many other women. Exactly. (laughs) Um, But you know, who has been your biggest inspiration or your greatest role model that has helped you tackle all these challenges and become the woman that you are today? I feel like I have been incredibly blessed that I am constantly being surrounded by women and people who genuinely want to see me succeed. And I really feel that that's a symptom of that I've always shown up incredibly earnestly Um, incredibly thoughtfully and as myself. People know that if I'm in their energy field, I generally just care about them and I'm not seeing them as a transaction or seeing them as what can I get out of them. I'm seeing the human in them. And growing up, I had the benefit of being able to look at the women in my life and how hard they worked and how crafty and how creative they worked to make ends meet. And that truly served as, as an inspiration. So my mother, my tia Magda, my abuelita, um, they really instilled in me just the, the value of you may come from where you have come from, but that is not a limit. This world is limitless. And so they've always supported the fact that I always went very left when everyone around me was doing the same exact thing. And then throughout my career, I've had the most incredible women that have shown up for me. In fact, I remember one of my previous um, mentors and bosses, she's the reason why I learned about salary negotiation because she realized that I was being grossly underpaid compared to my male counterparts, even though the one I was over delivering, overworking, and was basically a straight A student in the work in the workplace. And I always thank her and her name is Clara Pang. I always thank her for looking at me and saying, you need to ask for more. You need to know your worth and you need to negotiate your salary because what you are making is a lot less than everybody else around you. And that was the first time I had that kind of support from a woman. And then throughout my career, there's been many other women, Susan Line, Betty DeVita, 
that have truly just been there to want to have my back and see me succeed and see me win because they also knew how much passion I had for building brands and building businesses and connecting people. And then more recently, I had just been so lucky to meet so many incredible women through the We All Grow community. But more than anything, I'm just grateful to my partner, Ana Flores and Patty Arbiello that are sources of inspiration because these are self-made women. These are women that got creative and used the tools around them and looked at challenges and opportunities and built something that is going to leave a legacy that is truly creating an impact in the world. And now I have the privilege of learning from them and then I get to take those learnings and pass those on. And so I feel like every day I'm inspired by the women in our community because we have some badass women that show up every single day. And I've been meeting the most amazing human beings. Um, Linda Garcia, who's the author of Wealth Warrior, is somebody that I look up to and admire. Uh, Daniela Pierre Bravo, who is a, a reporter at MSNBC and also wrote a book called The Other. Um, and just these women that are showing up in these places that aren't created for them, but doing so anyway, inspire me every single day. And just women in general, even you, uh, you, you inspire me because you're choosing to show up and create this environment and create safe spaces for women of color to have these conversations. That for me, gives me a lot of joy to know, okay, there are so many good people doing a lot of good in this world that I can feel really happy and at ease knowing that there are others out there wanting to make this place happier and better and more equitable for us all. And so I feel that coming from childhood, the women in my life to the women that I've encountered in my career, my corporate career, to the women that I get to exchange energy with every single day today has been a blessing and, and inspire me. And then there's obviously like Jay Shetty, Young Pueblo. These are folks that like have written things, Michael Singer, that I are just like, whoa. And then of course, my queen of all queens, Oprah. I follow her as a Bible because what she has done really well is she has known how to monetize her personality and showed up authentically, regardless of what people think about her, even in spaces where people betted on her to fail. And she chose herself. And that for me will always serve an inspiration to choose me authentically as I am in this moment, because then that's how I was meant to show up in this space. That's incredibly beautiful. And thank you for that part where you said that. Of I was, course. I'm I mean, so that's... inspired by you. I think you are so eloquent and intelligent and how you speak <laughs> and you have so much emotional dexterity um, for someone your age, which isn't common, but that only tells me that you are actively caring about doing this work of self-evaluation and self-awareness to really create a more beautiful environment for, for women that go to, you know, your university. And that's awesome. So I want to give you like your kudos as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, I, I think things that I've learned are from talking with women like you and seeing all these amazing personalities like Oprah on TV and just having that normalized has been like just a role model. Uh, they've been role models in, in itself. And yeah. it speaks to the power of the power that women hold to, kind of leave behind a legacy of so many other more uh, upcoming women leaders or upcoming um, women mentors. Um, and just the fact that you get to work in a community every single day, this is your job. You get to speak with wow. these women. You have amazing partners. I think that is such a beautiful space for someone to grow and to, um, I guess, just live in every single day, personally and professionally. Um, I think, yeah, I think everyone should have like that kind of space of, uh, being with powerful women who are authentic and genuine and truly care about, you know, your growth personally, professionally in any space. Yeah, it really, it really matters. And this is not to say that I haven't been in environments where women were not kind to me. I absolutely had, but I knew that it was just coming from a place of insecurity. And it was also coming from a place of where they felt that they had to be that competitive in order to succeed. And I never met them there. I continue to just show up with a lot of grace and humility because I understood how difficult it is to be a woman of color in this world. And the more grace and the more I led with my heart, the more it invited that same kind of energy in return. And in fact, the more beautiful relationships I created throughout my life. And so who you spend your time with really, truly matters. 
Because if you want to go somewhere, then you need to hang out with the people that have been there. But so many folks take advice from people that claim to be a guru or an expert, but haven't actually been where it is that you want to go. So be very wary and cautious of who you're receiving information from. There's something that Brene Brown says that is so important is if you're not in the arena doing the work that I'm doing, your opinion has like zero value, right? That's not verbatim how she said it, but that's how I um, explain it in my own words. There's so many people that are doing a lot of things that are risky. There's so many people that are doing things that are worth the in this in this space, but sometimes they're doing it alone and that's okay. And so they seek to the left and right for inspiration. Seek to the people that are creating what it is that you want to do, that are be that are already where you want to be, and not the people that are going to give you advice from a place of fear or lack, or because perhaps even judgment, because they haven't they don't have the nerve to go and pursue what it is that you want to pursue. So I'm always very cautious on who I ask advice from, because again, I think of, will they understand my journey? Um, and no one will truly understand your point of view and that's okay. But again, it really doesn't matter who you share your energy with and who is around your circle, because that's really going to be a huge indicator in, in your next few milestones on where you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredibly relevant for being a college student um, and trying to, you know, figure out how to chart your path. You definitely don't want to spend your time with people that don't have the best intentions for yourself or just aren't capable of, you know, meeting where, where you are at and meeting you where you are at. And, you know, kind of, it's good to find someone that you can relate to and um, that, you know, want the best for your future. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, talking about your community with We All Grow, what does the future hold for that community and for yourself? Any, I know you mentioned that, you know, you want to write a few books or a script. So anything in that realm? <laughs> oh, my God. So the future for We All Grow Latina, I just see it as continuing to expand our Amiga hood. We have an app and you can search it in the app store. It's called the Amiga hood. And what I love about it is that we are now at over 25,000 community members and we're truly creating a place of safety where it's human, where you can connect with other humans in a really authentic and organic way. And the way that I envision us continuing to be able to show up for them is working with partners that understand that mission for with folks that care about building the socioeconomic power uh, for Latinas and continuing to just be there to serve through virtual programming. We have a lot more beautiful campaigns that we're planning for next year. In addition to our annual event, that is the thing that we are also known for. And just more than anything, creating, continuing to create from a place of soul and learning and hearing from them and what they need and showing up for them in those ways. And so, you know, as a business owner, when Anna and I get together to review the roadmap for the year, we don't look at the roadmap in terms of um, profit, right? Which is what is so backwards compared to how everybody else does it. We measure our roadmap based on impact. How are we making an impact to truly help the women in our community, to get them to get to the next level, to ensure that they're being nourished and supported? At the end of the day, we know we can't be something for everybody, but we truly try to be really intentional with how we show up. And so for us, intentionality in servicing them is a mission and a, and a pillar of ours. And so we always measure ourselves based on how the, the impact, the ripple of the impact. And so the future looks joyous and beautiful. And I can't wait to one day have like Amiga hood land. And it's just like all these incredible women from around the world, just gathering as we do every single year, but in a much bigger, bigger, bigger way. So we can continue to support and hold space for each other so that we could all grow together. That's incredibly beautiful. I, I just love that uh, we all grow is just continuously growing. And um, I was looking at the Instagram and I was just in awe of how big your following is. I think it's almost 300K. And that just shows that there are just so many minority women that are just looking for some space to be in and to feel yeah. safe in. And the fact that you guys are like filling this kind of gap where that's like greatly, you know, needed in this environment is just incredibly inspiring and beautiful. And I just love that, you know, all of these young women are going to be growing up in a generation where they have these resources available to them. And um, you mentioned like having a ripple effect and this community is something that is going to be, you know, present from generation to generation. And the impacts that you guys create on this woman is going to transfer from generation to generation and create ultimately a beautiful, a, 
a better future for Latina women, minority women, and for everyone ultimately, because, um, you know, when one woman succeeds, everyone else does as well. And you just, you just summarize that so beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's, I mean, it's all your guys' work and it's um, inspiring to me. Uh, but we successfully passed through all of the questions. So now we are going to go to the rapid fire round. Oh, oh my God, <laughs> rapid fire questions. Okay. Let me, let me get my <laughs> Yeah, I get a big sip. <laughs> but these are just like quick answers, spontaneous, whatever is on the top of your head. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. No pressure. Um, but yeah, let's get right into it. Let me pull it up. Okay. First one, describe yourself in three words. Describe myself in three words, creative, passionate, colorful. Yeah, that's beautiful. What do you do in your free time? What do I do in my free time? I love to journal. I love to cuddle with my boys. Um, I love going on road trips with my partner. He and I love traveling across the country and I really find solace in reading and writing and just connecting with myself. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, name one food that you could just not give up ever. Just one? Just oh, one. God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, God. I always say that I'm half human, half pasta, but it's so hard to just pick one because it's it's pasta, pizza, french fries. I oh cannot not either up, but definitely pasta. I love pasta. It's part of my... DNA like I need <laughs> that in my life <laughs> oh. um, if you could if you had to watch one tv show for the rest of your life and it was only one what would you pick oh my god this is the hardest question because <laughs> I love oh my god I love insecure I love new girl I love friends I love modern family um I love Abbott elementary <laughs> Oh, 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 this one's hard. I'm going to go with Insecure. Insecure. Okay, that's great. I love Issa, Issa Rae's in that, yeah. Love Issa Rae. <laughs> I, I want to be Issa Rae. I want to, I love Issa Rae because she is just always herself and gets paid for it. And that's my goal. <laughs> I know, she's, yeah, she's the definition of authentic on screen and off screen. She's beautiful. Awesome. <laughs> Last question. What is something that you haven't done that's on your bucket list? Right a script oh, okay yeah that yeah that that would that would that sounds amazing is it right. maybe a script for a tv show or a movie yeah either a, a, a romantic comedy or a tv show i feel like romantic comedies have fallen flat as of late and i have an idea for a script in a book that's really all about eating your way through heartbreak but eating pancakes for your heartbreak because <laughs> There's a point in time where, you know, I was having relationship issues and I lost my appetite. And one day I woke up and I was like, I'm finally hungry. And all I craved was pancakes, blueberry pancakes and tres leches pancakes. And oh. lucky for me, I found it. And then I just started writing and I realized how so many times we lose our identity in our relationships. And then everywhere you go is just a reminder of that relationship. And that was just a reminder of getting back to yourself so that you're not putting too much value on someone else's validation of you. And I want to write something regarding that. Oh my gosh, that I, I, I really relate to that because when you're in a relationship at a young age, like maybe in high school or college, you don't realize how much time or energy you invest into another person especially during a period where you're growing up and you're trying to create your own self. And so I, when I went through my first breakup, I didn't realize the effect it would have on my appetite and <sighs> just going to school every day and seeing reminders. I, I that book is going to be amazing. Cause I think so many like young girls and women are going to relate to that incredibly. So I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So you passed the rapid fire round. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, last question, just to end on an even more inspiring note, what advice would you give to young women entering the workforce, especially the world of entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. What advice I would give young women entering the workforce and the world of entrepreneurship? Understand your personal mission statement. What drives you and who you are? Get really familiar and comfortable with both the beautiful parts of you and the parts that perhaps you don't love so much because this world will absolutely test you. 
And you're going to find yourself in a lot of environments where folks are going to give you so much advice that will not be supportive or helpful because they're coming from their own projections, their own insecurities, or their own lived experiences that don't mirror your lived experiences. And so the advice would be truly get to know what makes you, you, what makes you jump out of bed and do what you want to do. And what is your personal why? Why is it that you want to create a business? What is the impact that you want to make in the world and allow that to be your guiding light for how you move forward. And remember that it's completely okay to build and lead from a place of soul. And it doesn't always have to be from your mind. It is okay to make a decision that's very heart centric because it, you can never go wrong. You can never go wrong when you acknowledge and honor your feelings versus just your thoughts. Yeah, I think like in my own experience of you know creating projects or even doing this podcast, Building it from the heart and listening to your soul is one of the reasons, the main reasons why I've stuck through with so many projects or this podcast, because it really speaks to my heart. And regardless of the views or the attention it gets, it feels like I'm doing something that is real to me. And the impact is like, it can't be quantified, honestly. It's just more about, you know, the if one person just listens to it and they have a different outlook on life, that's more than enough to keep this thing going. And I think keeping that center to whatever you do in life is, you know, essential to, you know, being happy, successful. Um, and yeah, I think that I love that piece of advice. Feed your soul. Feed your soul. <laughs> Feed your soul, just like food. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here, oh, taking the thank time. Thank you for having me. This is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, if there are any last words before we close out the podcast, speak your truth. <laughs> oh, speak my truth. Oh, I would just say human as however beautifully human you are, just know that you are loved and you are worthy and you deserve all of the beautiful things that this life has to offer. And a no is just an opportunity for redirection. And you're going to get lots of them in life, but they're not at all an indicator that you are worthy and are worthy of love as well. That's beautiful. What a way to end out this podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was nice to meet you. You too. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did. This is your host, Gowri Rangu, and I'll see you in the next episode of It's a Woman's World.